All right, so August of 69, the Woodstock Music and Arts Festival is happening uh, in a little town in upstate New York. Again, between four and 500,000 people are believed to have attended. And the who's who of the biggest rock artists of the day, everybody from you know Santana to Janis Joplin to the band uh, and to Richie Havens. And a key performance at Woodstock was the last performance. It was Monday morning, and this was a festival that started Friday night. Am I right about that? I think I'm right about that. It started Friday night, and it went pretty much solidly through Saturday, through Sunday. And then Monday morning, pretty much as the sun comes up and people are having their breakfast and whatever, um, and packing up, getting ready to go. Lots and lots and lots of people had already gone. It was estimated on Monday morning that there were only about 30,000 people left. 30,000 is still a huge group, but when, the, you know, it was only less than 10% of the, the peak at the festival. The artist who comes on stage was the artist who, one of the artists who burned the brightest at the Monterey Pop Festival in California, and that was Jimi Hendrix. Hendrix comes on Monday morning and begins a rendition of the Star Spangled Banner on his guitar. Our nation's national anthem played on an electric guitar in a way that nobody had ever heard before in a way that nobody's ever heard since. Um, and if you listen to it on Spotify, and I, I hope you listen to it somewhere, if you've never heard Jimi Hendrix's version of the Star Spangled Banner, you owe it to yourself to hear it, if only to say that you've heard it. It's extraordinary. You don't have to like it, but I want you to sit through it. Even if halfway through it, you're like, I can't do this anymore. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. It's not that long. It's the Star Spangled Banner, for heaven's sake. Okay? Sit through it. Um, and it closed the show, literally. At Woodstock, when it was done, Jimi Hendrix, I believe, set his guitar on fire. And... The festival came to a close, and this generational um, pivot point was over. The summer of 69 was over. The 1960s were over. And um, if you go on to Spotify, the uh, Jimi Hendrix version of the Star Spangled Banner is there. Give it a spin. Also on Spotify, I included the song Woodstock by the great band Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. And Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, a uh, terrific group that had, they were soft rock in their flavor, but they definitely had roots in country, they had roots in folk, they had roots in straight up rock and roll. Great, great artists. Um, sometimes they recorded just as Crosby, Stills and Nash because the young part was a guy named Neil Young who most famous for a song called Heart of Gold, if you're familiar, in the 70s. I think we play that in a couple chapters. Keep me searching for a heart of gold. That song. Um, so sometimes he recorded with them and sometimes he, he didn't. So, uh, but at Woodstock was Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. And the song Woodstock, I include as, as part of this. So Woodstock really brings the curtain on the 60s. And there are two events that happen in the very late 
waning hours of 1969, one of which is Altamont, and we're going to talk about that in the next chapter. And the other is uh, the f maybe not the first, but it's the most widely publicized case of sort of domestic terrorism that had happened up to that point. 1969, I'm not going to tell you all the background of it because I don't know all the background of it, but it was the Manson family led by a guy named Charles Manson. They lived together communal style in the desert of California. And for a variety of reasons, Manson told some of his followers to go and exact revenge or to exact Helter Skelter, in the words of the Beatles song from the White Album, on um, certain houses. One house that he chose was being, I think was owned by a man named Terry Melcher, who was a music producer, had done some stuff with the Beach Boys, Dennis Wilson in particular of the Beach Boys. And Charles Manson tried to get a recording contract with Terry Melcher and Terry Melcher basically turned him down. And Charles Manson did not take kindly to being rejected and had it in to have Terry Melcher killed, sent his family to Terry Melcher's to kill him. What he either didn't realize or didn't care about was the fact that Terry Melcher had rented his home to a film producer named Roman Polanski. And Roman Polanski and his girlfriend, who was a movie star named Sharon Tate, lived there. Now, Sharon Tate was not a big movie star, but she was kind of on her way up. She'd been in some, some big movies at this point. And she was eight months pregnant with Roman Polanski's child. And when Roman Polanski happened to be in Europe filming on the night when the Manson family came to call and Sharon Tate, her unborn child, and three house guests that she had staying with her were all murdered. And another murder the next night happened um, with a couple named Leo and Rosemary LaBianca. Remembering these details is not important, but remember this. This was December of 1969 when this happened, a few months after Woodstock, a few months after man landed on the moon. It was a time when, you know, culturally speaking, we should have been at our apex and it was almost like there was this balance created after all these wonderful things happened that we had to have this monstrously horrible thing happen. It was domestic terrorism of the highest order and I remember, frankly, and this is a little personal, you know, but whatever. I remember being a little kid and being scared of Charles Manson, you know, of having that sense that he was the, um, uh, the boogeyman. It was... It was a horrible time, not the first time and not the last time that people's lives will be taken in the name of something ridiculous, but um, it was a crazy time. And it was the time of the cults and time of communal living. And this is one time it did not go well. Anyway, so Woodstock, hopefully you got everything that I want you to know about that. Jimi Hendrix closed the show. And the 60s closed on some of the highest highs and some of the lowest lows this country had ever seen. We're going to talk next chapter about Altamont, the absolute antithesis, the absolute opposite of Woodstock that happened just a few months later. And uh, then we move into the 1970s, another, another great decade of rock and roll. So I'll see you next time.